Y'all are doing well this morning. It's good to see you. Good to be together. Well, we're going to continue our series, Justice and the Kingdom of God. Um, we are on part five of our seven-part series, so we are, are reaching the pinnacle and the climax of our, of our series. Um, think a little bit about where we've, where we've come so far. In our first, first part, our first sermon, we went back to the foundations of the biblical story, and there we saw that, that justice and righteousness is central to God's purpose in the world, and it is so from creation. We also saw in that lesson how God works in the world to bring about justice and righteousness. One, through his own divine action and judgment, and also through human agency. He wants humans to contribute to that work and share in that, share in that work. Then we turn to the, the laws of the Torah, several of the laws in the Torah, to help us see, okay, how does God define justice and righteousness? What, is it, what does it actually look like? And there we, we saw, in particular, God's special uh, concern for the most vulnerable people, right? And, and the laws that were designed to protect and provide for, and His will for the people of Israel, that they would do that. They would protect and provide for the most vulnerable in their society. Then we turn to the prophets, and we saw both the indictment of the prophets and the exhortation of the prophets. The thing is, Israel did not fulfill what God called them to do. And so rather than a, a, a uh, nation in which justice and righteousness abounded, the indictment is there's no justice. Yet God holds out his hand and, on, and urges his people forward and says, if, if you uh, would just do justice and righteousness, you would be like that sunrise, right? That beauty and that glory of the sunrise. And then last time, we turned to the Psalms. And, and, and that's where we really start to get into the heart of justice, right? Where we, where we ache with those who ache, where we, where we rejoice with those who rejoice, right? The laments that, that are just crying out, saying, there is no justice, God. God, will you make it right? And then the, the psalms of praise that, that celebrate and that hope in the fact that God will, in fact, do that. And so at the end of that sermon, we sort of drew the conclusion that, that we, we recognized how all of our hopes, right, are, anything that we long for, all, all of our hopes are, are hinged upon and, and rooted in the, the, the fact that, that, that we need God to restore his kingdom and his reign. So the, this idea of the kingdom of God. And so what I want to do today before we turn to the gospel and look and see how Jesus brought justice and brings justice and, and our role as the church, I want, to, I want to step back and look at the, the law and the prophets and the writings, the Old Testament as a whole, and, and just get a sense of the expectation, right? The promises. So this, this sermon is justice promises. And so, um, I, again, for our purposes today, rather than, than, you know, just Genesis through the end, I, I want to camp out in Isaiah. I, Isaiah is so uh, representative uh, of so many of the promises of the kingdom of God. So we'll actually spend our time in Isaiah today, if you want to go ahead and open up to that. But I want to begin by just making this observation. We're going to talk about justice specifically, but it's important that we understand that, that the hope of the Scriptures, if you were to summarize the hope of the Scriptures in a phrase, in, a, in, a, in an expression, it's the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom of God, the, the, the hope that, that God would again restore His rightful reign, that He would deal with what's wrong, and that He would usher in what's right, and establish peace, and salvation, and joy, and all these, all these good things, and, and in, under His rightful, glorious, good reign. That's all captured in the phrase kingdom of God. Kingdom of God's a, a shorthand for all those promises and purposes of, of, of God. Um, but, but what we could say is, chief among all those multifaceted promises is justice and righteousness, right? That, that um, when he does that, when he establishes that reign, when he sends his Messiah, when he gives his spirit, he will administer justice and righteousness. He will establish a kingdom of justice and righteousness. So if you're in Isaiah, what I'd like to do, and we see justice and righteousness center part of that, what I'd like to do with you this morning for the bulk of our time is just go on a tour of Isaiah. I want to, I've selected several 
passages in Isaiah that key into this idea of hope in the kingdom of God, and then in particular say something about God's justice and righteousness, how he will do what's right and make it, make it right. And so as, as, we, as we go on this tour of Isaiah together, what I'd like to urge you to do and invite you to do along with me is dream together, right? Um, this, this is one of the things that's so important in reading the prophets is that, we, that our, our minds, our hearts, our imaginations are just filled up with this imagery, with these metaphors, with these pictures, these visions of the work of God, the promises of God, the, the, the mighty things that God is going to do. And let it speak to us on that imaginative level, um, because that's what the language of the prophets is doing. It's transcending our own just day-to-day, face-to-face experiences and, and elevating them higher to a greater and more glorious picture. And so Isaiah chapter 1, let's walk through this together. So we've already looked at the first 20 verses back a few weeks ago when we were looking at the prophets. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 20 was sort of our, one of our anchor places. But look at verse 21. Isaiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. How the faithful city has become a harlot. She who was full of justice, righteousness once lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your drink diluted with water, your rulers are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and chases after rewards. They do not defend the orphan, nor does the widow's plea come before them. Right? So, so what we see in those verses is a summary of what we saw a few weeks ago. Again, the indictment is no justice. God had, had called Israel to be this nation that would do justice and righteousness. And what do we see? Murderers thieves. They're not defending the orphans. They're not defending the widow. So here's God's response in verse 24. Therefore the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, declares, I will be relieved of my adversaries and avenge myself on my foes. I'll also turn my hand against you and smelt away your dross as with lye and remove all of your alloy. Right? So it's this picture of this this fire that's coming to to purge the impurities but notice as this purging of the impurities is happening, what's, what's this process? What's going on? It's a refinement, right? It's, it's getting rid of what's wrong. It's getting rid of evil. And so through that purifying, purging fire, look at verse 26. Then I will restore your judges as at the first, your counselors as at the beginning. After that, you will be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. Zion will be redeemed with justice and her repentant ones with righteousness, but transgressors and sinners will be crushed together and those who forsake the Lord will come to an end. Do you see that? Okay. So there's this retributive language, right? Fire sounds very retributive, doesn't it? But notice the aim of that retributive language, restoration, right? On the other side of the, the purifying fire, what do you have? Not this total destruction, but purification and restoration. What, what you see now is, is injustice and violence and murder and all this sort of stuff. But on the other side, you'll finally see what God's wanted all along. Justice and righteousness. Take a look at chapter 2. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. This is a, a, an even greater forward look to the kingdom to come. In in Isaiah 2, beginning in verse 2, Now it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it, and many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his path. For the law will go forth from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem." For, make sure we see this scene, right? Imagine all these various mountains in the world, and they're representing, representing these various kingdoms, right? And yet, you look at all these mountains, and God's mountain is raised up. God's kingdom, God's temple is, is raised up. And notice what people are doing. They're streaming up to it, right? God has bent over backwards throughout history to teach people and to lead people and to guide them in the way of what's right. And and what has humanity done? Resisted him at every step of the way. But here in this vision, what you see is people are longing to learn God's ways. And so they're streaming up to it. And look at what we see in verse 4. He will judge between the nations and render decisions for many peoples 
and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. Do you see that image of peace at the end? Right? You take all the implements of war and violence and they're transformed into these implements of peace, of flourishing, of, of human prospering and just like what, what the Hebrew word would be shalom. What, what brought about that peace? Look at the beginning of verse 4 again. He will render judgment and make decisions. It's God's act as that king, that royal judge, right? Administering judgment, administering justice. And that judgment, that justice is what brings peace. We're familiar with the phrase, no justice, no peace. It's rooted in Scripture. It's not just something somebody came up with. It's rooted in Scripture. That peace comes from justice, God's justice. What we see then after this this vision of the kingdom in these first few verses of chapter 2, the rest of chapter 2 and 3 and 4 describe this day of the Lord. It's a, it's a phrase that's used throughout the prophets to describe a day of, a day of judgment. I, I'll note just a few, just so we, just so we can add this to our, our map together as we're, as we're walking on this. But look at, um, look at verse 11. I won't read all these, but, but I want to zoom in on a few of these. Chapter 2 and verse 11. The proud look of man will be abased. The loftiness of man will be humbled. And the Lord, or Yahweh alone, will be exalted in that day. Verse 12, for Yahweh of hosts will have a day. Some of your translations may add of reckoning, a day of reckoning against everyone who's proud and lofty, against everyone who's lifted up, that he may be abased. And so you you notice throughout this, three times it said the Lord alone will be exalted. Jump on to chapter 3 and and look at verses 13 and following. The Lord arises to contend and stands to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment with his elders and his princes and his people. It is you who've devoured the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor? declares the Lord God of hosts. Now we see, okay, again, this retributive language that we saw back in chapter 1, there we saw it had this restorative end. Here we see who it's for, God, who God is responding to. He's responding to the cries of the afflicted, the oppressed, the, the, those who are, <clears throat> who are crushed, the, the poor and the vulnerable who have become victims of oppression and injustice, right? And notice his judgment is on their behalf and in response to those crimes against them. Now let's jump to chapter 9. Again, this is a tour. We <clears throat> Isaiah 9 is, is a, a really beautiful messianic text that, that, that anticipates this coming king from the line of David. And listen to um, what's said here. In verse 2, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Just flood your heart with that image, right? Darkness to light. You will multiply the nation. You'll increase their gladness. They'll be glad in your presence as with the gladness of, of harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil, right? There's the, this is, this is the, the time of the year for the greatest celebration when the harvest is coming in. He says that's what it will be. You will break the yoke of their burden and the staff of their shoulders as, if, as uh, the rod of their oppressor is at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the tumult, the cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, fuel for fire, right? And, and so, right, how, why is that light coming? Why is that rejoicing coming? Because the, the, that, that slave master, that oppressor, that yoke is being lifted off of them. How does this come about? Verse 6. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. To do what? To establish it 
and uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this, right? So do you see darkness to light, you know, celebration like harvest time, the enemies are being uh, over, overturned, the slave masters are being overturned, right? Because this king will come to do it, and what's he going to do? He's going to establish, reign in justice and righteousness. Turn to chapter 11. We'll actually pick up the last two verses of chapter 10. So 10, verse 33. <clears throat> verse 33. Behold, the Lord, the God of hosts, will lop off the boughs with a terrible crash. Those who are tall in stature will be cut down, and those who are lofty will be abased. He'll cut down the thickets of the forest with an iron axe, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one, right? So in the, one of the earlier images, we were picturing all the kingdoms of the world as these mountains. Now they're pictured as these tall trees in a forest, and they're all chopped down. But look at 11 and verse 1. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, A branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he'll delight in the fear of the Lord. He'll not judge by what his eyes see. He's not judging by appearances. He'll not judge, uh, make a decision by what his ears hear. He's He's not basing his judgment on hearsay. But with righteousness, He will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins. Faithfulness, the belt about his waist. And what will will come about as a result of this king's work of justice and righteousness? The wolf will will dwell with the lamb The leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. A little boy will lead them. Also the cow and bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Right? Do you see... That picture of peace we saw back in 2-4 now is expanded into this this greater picture of peace, right? Where you see these these natural enemies are bosom buddies, are are close in in close intimate fellowship. And 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 what where did that peace come from? From the work of this Messiah who will judge in righteousness and justice. Let's jump to chapter 25 for just a minute. This was one I didn't end up putting in your, in your outline, but I want to I go ahead and take a look at this really quick. <clears throat> chapter 25 begins with, with words like we might find in the Psalms, just this endearing picture, a, a, a love letter to God. O oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name, for you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness, right? So you're expecting this, this, you know, God has done this amazing thing. He's fulfilled his plan. He's accomplished his purposes. And so, God, you are my God. I exalt you. What are we expecting to hear that he's done? Look at verse 2. You've made the city into a heap a fortified city into a ruin. A palace of strangers is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, a strong people will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. That's probably not what we're expecting to find, right? We're expecting to find like, you know, harvest and light language again, right? But what what do we see in those verses? Ruin and destruction, right? How come they're celebrating that? Look at verse 4. For you have been a defense of the needy, of the helpless, 
a, a, a defense for the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat, for the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall. Like heat and drought, you subdue the uproar of aliens. Heat by the shadow of a cloud, the song of the ruthless is silent. <clears throat> Why are they rejoicing? Destruction, you know, the, the cities are ruined. Why is that good news? Because what God's doing in that is defending and helping and saving and restoring. And that opens up the picture in verse 6 to the, it, where it says, The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow, refined aged wine. On this mountain, he'll swallow up the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is stretched over all nations. He'll swallow up death. For all time. What Paul will go on to call the, the last enemy, he's dealing with death. He'll swallow up death for all time. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and he'll remove the reproach of his people from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. So he's dealing with death. He's taking away tears. He's taking away shame. That's reason for rejoicing and celebration and praise. Let's jump to chapter 32. Chapter 32, in verses 9 through 14, he paints a picture of a desolate wilderness and more or less is saying, this is the, this is the situation of my people Israel, right? You could describe their spiritual state, their society, even literal consequences of, of their sin, and it's a desolate wilderness. And he says, that will be the way things are, verse 15, until... Until what? Until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high and the wilderness becomes a fertile field and the fertile field is considered a forest, right? Do you see this picture in your mind where imagine society, imagine the world is this desolate wilderness, right? Just there's no life, no substance. It's just, it's just this place of death and it's that until not God sends the rain, <laughs> but God sends his spirit like a deluge of rain, and that will bring about this new life, this new creation, this transformation. And what, what comes about of that work of the spirit? Verse 17, And the work of righteousness will be peace, and the service of righteousness, quietness, and confidence forever. Then my people will live in a peaceful habitation and secure dwellings and in undisturbed resting places. Again, justice and righteousness and peace from God's Spirit. Go to chapter 35. Again, in chapter... Do, do, do note this in chapter 34 for just a minute because I want, I, want I want you to at least see this day language one more time. Chapter 34 and verse 8, he describes the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. And then in the verses that follow, it's again more wilderness language, right? So again, desolate wilderness and all this, all this stuff. Then look at verse 35. The wilderness and the desert will be glad. The Araba will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will blossom profusely and rejoice with rejoicing and shout of joy. The glory of Lebanon, this great forest, will be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon, two mountains in northern Israel. They will see the glory of Yahweh, the majesty of our God. So he says, encourage who? Those who are exhausted. Strengthen the feeble, the weak. Say to those with an anxious heart, Take courage. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. The recompense of God will come, but he will save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer. The tongue of the mute will shout for joy. Waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah, in this desert land. The, the scorched land will become a pool. The thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackal its resting places. Grass, reeds, rushes, 
A highway will be there, a roadway. It will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks on the way. Fools will not wander there. There will be no lion nor any vicious beast will go upon it. These will not be found there, but who? But the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion with everlasting joy upon their heads. They'll find gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away, right? Isn't that what we long for? We talked about that in our psalm study last time, right? We're so sick of sighing. We're so sick of sorrow. We're sick of the tears. And yet he describes this day, this age, this time in which that wilderness that we know of as life right now will be transformed into this flourishing, abundant paradise. And notice how integrated this is to justice, to restoration of the vulnerable, Look at Isaiah 42. Where we see this messianic language in the first half of Isaiah, the image shifts from messianic king to suffering servant. But I want you to notice the mission of this servant in Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42 and verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He'll not cry out or raise his voice. He'll not make his verse heard in the street. A bruised uh, reed he will not break. A dimly burning wick he'll not extinguish. Basically, those who are weak and frail, he's not going to just snuff them out. He'll nourish and nurture them. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he's established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his laws. Jump on down. Again, I don't want to just completely saturate us with with so much text that we miss it, but we we need to pick up a little bit more of this language. Look at the end of verse verse 6. I'll appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations to do what? to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, right? And down in verse 9, Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare to you new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you. All right, let's look at... Let's jump to verse 56. I'm sorry, not verse 56, chapter 56. Again, there's a few extra references in in your outline that you can look at, but I want to just, I want us to see at least one example of this parallelism. Look at Isaiah 56 and verse 1. Therefore, thus says the Lord, thus says Yahweh, preserve justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness is to be revealed. Notice the parallelism there, right? Salvation is not contrasting God's righteousness. They're parallel. They're, they're, they're harmonious ideas, integrated ideas. And then one more. Let's go to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, and we'll, we'll end our tour here. One more rich messianic text before we close. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of spirit of fainting, so they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They'll raise up the former devastations and they'll repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations, Strangers will stand and pasture your flocks. Foreigners will be your farmers and your vine dressers. 
but you will be called the priests of the Lord. You will be spoken of as ministers to our God. You will eat the wealth of nations, and in the riches you will boast, instead of shame, a double portion. Instead of humiliation, uh, they will shout for joy over their portion. They will possess a double portion of land. Everlasting joy will be theirs, right? So, so what we see in this picture is this, this again, overwhelming picture of flourishing and abundance and joy and peace and all, all the stuff that we long for and cry out for and ache for and are searching for in the vain things that sometimes we get caught up in, right? Those are those deep longings that we have. And Isaiah is laying it out in front and saying, this is what God's going to do. Look at, look at the next verse. For I, Yahweh, love justice. Notice how this picture of flourishing and abundance is, is intimately, inextricably linked to the fact that God is a God of justice. I hate robbery in the burnt offering. I'll faithfully give them their recompense and make an everlasting covenant with them. Then their offspring will be known among the nations, their descendants in the midst of the peoples, all who see them recognize because they're the offspring whom the Lord has blessed. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He's wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts and a garden causes the things sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. All right. Let's take a second. Just breathe and let... Let the dust settle a little bit. Let some of that gel. I know that was a lot. I wanted, to, wanted us to feel it a little bit. But we're going to take a little bit of time to process. So let's think about, again, that tour of Isaiah. What did we see is the, is the hope, is the promise, is the expectation of what God is going to do, particularly overall in his kingdom, but in particularly in regards to justice and righteousness. The hope, the promise, the expectation is this. God will bring justice and righteousness. We may see slivers of it here and there, but again, we, we saw this in our psalm studies. Like, man, that's, we long for that, don't we? We, we long for what's right. And the, the promise, the expectation is God will do it. The Messiah will bring justice and righteousness. Did you notice in, in at least three of the texts that we looked at that talk about the Messiah, this coming Messianic figure, like four, Isaiah 61 as well, right? What is the mission of the Messiah? To do, to bring justice and righteousness. Well, what about the Spirit? Right? We just looked at one of the, the promises of the Spirit in Isaiah 32, but what's the promise of the Spirit? What's connected with the giving and the pouring out of the Spirit? The Spirit will bring justice and righteousness, right? There's, a, there's language of a day of justice and righteousness, um, a day of, of uh, the Lord, the day of Yahweh, a day of judgment. It's described as a day of reckoning, a day of reversal, a day of rectification, a day of rescue, a day of redemption, but it's this language of a day, right? And any in the room familiar with the New Testament will immediately make the connection to what Jesus is talking about what Paul is talking about, what John is talking about, drawing on this language from the prophets of this day of the Lord. Not only this day where wrongs are made right in this judgment scene, but, but there's also this picture of this age of justice and righteousness. Not only these acts of justice will take place, but that will open up, again, the kingdom of God that will be defined by justice and righteousness. And so then when we step back, again, and see all this together, the work of God, the work of the Messiah, the work of the Spirit, this day, this age, the hope, the kingdom of God will be, will bring justice and righteousness. But now let's come back to this idea of justice and righteousness, and I want to I want to get a little bit further down the road on, on how we define it, how we understand it. Because again, I know there's still misconceptions. We still may hear the word justice and think something, but hopefully we've seen enough of the scriptures now to, to be able to firmly latch on to this. 
When we, when we think about justice and righteousness in the kingdom of God, I said this in our opening lesson, it is not justice versus grace, mercy, salvation, etc. These are not contrasting aspects of what God will do. It's not like justice is over here, mercy and grace and salvation is over here, right? right. It's not that, oh, I know God's just, but man, thank God that he's at least merciful, those aren't, did you notice how, how that is not a thing in Isaiah? Those are, those are not opposing things. It's, it's the justice of God is gracious, is merciful, is saving, right? The, that, that's how you, de, the, those terms that, we're, that we, we long for and cling for, grace and mercy and salvation, all those things, right? Those are lumped in with God's justice as, it, as how, how you describe and define his justice. Um, it's gracious, it's merciful, it's saving, Think about some of these terms that, that we, we read. Faithfulness, loving kindness, grace, compassion, all characteristics of God. Or redemption, light, salvation, peace, actions of God, work of God, blessings from God. Notice all of these in the text that we looked at depend on, flow from, are parallel to, or are interconnected with God's justice and righteousness. Justice means salvation, right? Justice establishes and nourishes peace. And so here, here's the thing that we see when we, when we walk through the Scriptures and say, okay, what does the Bible say about justice and judgment? It's a blessing. It's good news. It's not this thing that we want to run from or degrade or just thank God that that's not the, the, the thing. Did you see how over and over and over again, whether we, we could go back to the Psalms for this, we could, or just in the text that we looked at in Isaiah, right? how it's p- pictured as a blessing, something praiseworthy, something to celebrate, something to pray for, something to long for. Right? It's, it's blessing. It's good news. And, and here's the, the key in this. Justice in the kingdom of God is more than retribution. If we were just talking about retribution, of course we would say, yeah, we, we don't want that, right? But that's why I'm saying we've got we've to see that bigger picture of, of justice. It's more than retribution. It is restoration. And ultimately, and we saw this as, as early as chapter 1, the retributive action, anything that we would lump under that retributive category or language, has a restorative aim and end. Now, we, we recognize that, that our best attempts at justice fall for, far short, don't they? I and mean, that's just the, the, the sad reality. From the, the gross injustices to just the feeble attempts to actually make things right. You, you think about an example like this. An innocent man is murdered, and the murderer is convicted. Is justice done in that in that? An innocent man is murdered, and the, the, the murderer is convicted. Is justice done? Well, normally we'd say, yeah, okay, the, the justice was done. But to a point, right? Does the conviction bring the murdered man back? He's still dead. There's still a loss. There's still this ache. There's still this wrong that's not fully made right just by a, a conviction, right? Right? That conviction doesn't restore, but notice God's justice does. Justice in the kingdom of God is greater than punishment. It's new creation, right? You think about how, how many of those passages in Isaiah drew on new creation language, right? A wilderness transformed into this paradise, right? That's what, that's, that's what God's justice is. It's not just punishment. It's saying restoration, new creation, Here's a, here's a quote I came across uh, several months ago, or a few months ago, that, that walks through this for us. Um, God's judging does not mean an abstract, neutral, judicial act, right? In other words, it's not just this kind of cold justice where he's just arbitrarily responding to rights or wrongs in the world. It's not this, this abstract, neutral, judicial act, but an active saving, 
rearranging of broken relationship. In the context of justice, this means to save from oppression, to liberate, to rescue. This means that in the Bible we should not associate with the words judging, justice, righteousness with the Greek and Roman traditions, that is, with either judicial institutions or abstract virtues of individuals, but rather with, and this is beautiful, rather with God's community building and protective power. Now, doesn't that fit the language of Isaiah 1? If we try to just cram in, again, cold courtroom scenes of arbitrary, you know, gavel banging, that, that doesn't, you don't see that in Isaiah, right? But when you think about this restorative work to make things right and to build and to transform, now we're in step with what the prophets saw. So how is this justice and righteousness and judgment good news? Is new creation good news? But but let me me hit at this for one one, one other angle. What keeps us from seeing God's judgment as a blessing? There's there's a lot of things that we could look at here. I think part of it has to do with our view of sin. The, The picture of sin in the scriptures is bigger and more multifaceted than sometimes we, I think, we recognize. Sin is definitely something we do that we need forgiveness of, right? Do we, we recognize that. We, when, we, when we walk to the Scriptures, we see sin described as something humans do that they're in need of forgiveness of, right? Um, humans failing to live as we should, right? A moral failure, but, but even more a vocational failure, a failure to be image of God, a failure to be the royal priest, a failure to accomplish God's goal for us in creation, But it's also more than that. Sin in the Bible is not just something we do. Sin is a power that holds over us. We see this as early as Genesis 4. The first time we read the word sin in the Bible, how is it described? What's God tell, tell Cain? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? But if you do not do well, he says, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. How does he describe sin there? Right? Not just as something that Cain would do or not do, but as a power that's seeking to overcome him and, 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 and rule over him and enslave him. Does Paul talk that way? Of course he does. Think about Romans 7, right? Sin seeking its advantage through the law, right? Deceived me and tempted me and enslaved me, right? So, so we see sin is also a power that we need rescued from, that we need freed from. And so when we can see, okay, sin is not just something that I do that I need forgiven of. Sin is also this power that rules over me that I need rescued from. Is God's justice and righteousness and judgment against sin good news? It absolutely is, right? And so again, part of maybe our our struggle to fully latch on to justice is good news, judgment is good news, is maybe our view of sin is a little too small. And so when we see sin from this larger perspective, we see justice as something we desperately need, not something we want to avoid. All right, let's let's just sum all this up. If you're to take that, that hope, that expectation in the kingdom of God in regards to justice and righteousness, what's our hope? God will make it right. I'll do my best to be right and make right, but I entrust myself fully to God who will make it right. That's our hope. That's what we put, that's all our eggs go in that basket, that God is going to sort it out, God's going to work it out, God is going to make it right. Let me end with a note of empowerment. You think about what we said about how, how interconnected justice and righteousness is to the kingdom of God and to that hope of what God is going to do. And so if, if the kingdom of God is justice and righteousness, when God's people do justice and righteousness, we are in step with the powerful work of God. And what do you see? A sign and a foretaste of that kingdom of God to come. Now, that elevates the things that we do, right? It's not just an action we do, a box we check, or whatever. It's a sign and a foretaste of what God is going to do. 
when you pray for those who suffer, when you weep with those who weep, when you protect and provide for the vulnerable, when you're an advocate, a defender, a rescuer, a helper, when you open your hand to give and reach out your hand to raise up, when you welcome the stranger, when you open your table, when you open your home, when you open yourself up and invest yourself in others, when you love your neighbor as yourself. Right? That's ultimately what we're talking about when we talk about doing justice and righteousness. It's saying, love your neighbor as yourself. When we do that, again, it's a sign and a foretaste. Just a, that, that just taste of what it will be in the fullness of the kingdom of God. What Peter says we still long for and wait for. Jesus is on the throne, and yet we, we still wait for that last enemy to be defeated. Let's pray together. Father, we are in desperate need of your righteous, merciful, gracious, saving judgment. We long for you to make it right. We're so thankful for the powerful work of righteousness that you've accomplished in Jesus and his death on the cross and the hope that we have grounded on the resurrection. Father, we ache and we weep and we cry out as we suffer in this world. As we experience and, and, and witness injustice as we face the pains of this present evil age and all that is still broken and not as you would have it to be. And so we long for you and, and cry out to you and, and entrust ourselves to you who is the faithful and righteous and merciful judge to, to right what is wrong and bring us safely into your eternal kingdom. We are so thankful for the hope, the promises, the confidence that we can have because of who you are over and against who we are and, and yet leading us to a transformation and a new creation. We love you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're with us this morning and need our prayers for anything, um, any grief that you're carrying, any, anything that you need encouragement or help with, we'd love to do that. And if you're ready to put on Christ, Give your allegiance to him. We'd love to baptize you in his name for the forgiveness of sins. If there's anything we can do, please come forward as we stand and sing.